Welcome to the Success Pick and Mix podcast with me, Nikki Raby. I began this conversation of success and its complexities in 2018. And over 500 episodes later, it seems there is a lot to say. (laughs) So we talk about personal branding, money, mindset, marketing, reinvention, visibility, and doing what you love, making it real and making it happen. Because success isn't a straight line. It isn't the same for everyone and it's constantly changing as we do. Here you'll find mini episodes joining me behind the scenes, plus interviews with some of the most exciting voices out there. I can't wait to share this with you. So don't miss an episode. Subscribe, rate, review, you know, all the things. Oh, and one final thing. This isn't really about me. This is about you. Today can be that day that you start. And I can't wait to hear what is next for you. So the interviews are back. I am so thrilled. These interviews have been safely tucked away on my laptop for a little while now. And I'm really pleased to launch this brand new series. The first guest is an amazing star. Her name is June Angelides and... If you look at her Instagram, you will get a small insight into all the things that she does. So she's an investor at Samos Investments. She's an entrepreneur and activist. She's a columnist for the Financial Times and she's sometimes on TV. She's got three kids. But most of all, she's a really lovely person. She's so supportive. She's just got such a great energy. And I really feel like she's an open book. And she's somebody in my network who is now a friend who I really feel is authentic, if we may use that word, and themselves. So I know that you will get so much from this episode. Today, I wanted to ask June about investing and growth and scale and how you do that. And I still feel like it's quite a hidden world that very few are privy to. So I really wanted to break down the conversation, ask all the daft questions so you don't have to. Here's the episode. Enjoy, enjoy, and let us know what you think you can tag us on social media at Nikki Raby and at June Angelides I will leave all the details down below enjoy the episode June welcome welcome to the podcast I'm so excited to have you I am so excited to be here thank you so much for having me on Oh, I've got, we've got so much to talk about. Um, But yes, please introduce yourself. Let us know who you are and what you do. And um, yeah, where you're up to in this crazy, crazy time that we're having. Oh, so I am June Angelides. I'm an early stage investor at Samos, but I'm probably best known for starting a social enterprise called Mums in Tech, which was a child-friendly coding school for moms. And yes, it is what it kind of says on the tin. We would go into tech companies and convert their meeting rooms into a classroom and a crash. And I would turn up with about 15 moms and 15 babies. And over eight weeks, we would learn about all things tech. How do you go from an idea to a product, whether it be a website or an app, and really take them through the basics. You know, what is, what is a product? You know, what is UX? What is HTML, CSS, JavaScript? How do you hire a developer? How do you have that conversation and translate that idea into something tangible? And most importantly, you know, giving them that community to have other women around them that were on that journey that wanted to learn more about tech, maybe hadn't felt comfortable in your traditional spaces and perhaps hadn't been able to afford to go to a traditional coding boot camp, which can be quite expensive and quite time intensive. So we, you know, my primary aim was to create a safe space where people felt comfortable, could bring their babies, which didn't exist. It was the first one in the UK and have an amazing network of mentors in in the tech company delivering the content available to them outside of the lessons to really help push that um, vision forward. And, you know, you know, when, when you've got people around you ready to support you, I think that's sort of that first hurdle. And, And I, and I, you know, look back and think about what you're doing and how you help people make their dreams a reality. It's, it's that, 
having one person who supports you and says you can do it you sometimes that's yes. really what it takes to to make you believe it does because actually um having that idea that's swimming around your head for a long time but actually saying it out loud and then certainly saying it out loud to somebody who you're going to pay the amount of times where people go oh that feels so good to say that out loud I've never told that to anybody ever yeah. before I'm like what but what not to your husband not to your wife not to like really uh. um, but were you in the coding space before or was this all like brand new were you learning as you went as well it was totally brand new for me. That's you know, what I thought. People assumed that I was teaching. I was not teaching. And you know, this really started when I was on my, my second maternity leave and I'd worked at a, a venture um, venture debt an venture debt team at Silicon Valley Bank. I'd been there for a year and I'd been working with so many amazing, um, talented entrepreneurs and you know, just learning so much about technology. And I realized I don't really know the basics of, of coding and how they're building these companies and I thought you know what this is a great time I've got a year of what is it let me see what it's like to to build something and very quickly realize when trying to hire a developer that I just didn't speak their language I didn't mm. understand what APIs were and, and you know SEO and I, I hadn't had to to really dig into the, the the deep tech before in my role it was more about the finance and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have that conversation with them? So we started looking at courses I could take, you know, initially started with um, courses for moms and very quickly found that there weren't any. There was just courses, you know, mommy baby classes, you know, mm. reading. And I thought, you know, did no one think that we want to learn something as well? And it, it really surprised me. But then I was quite frustrated that, you know, it didn't exist. So I said to myself, if it doesn't exist, I'm going to build it. <laughs> As and do. isn't it annoying sometimes when you have that realization where you're like yeah the idea is not gonna leave me oh it's no not. it turns <laughs> out I'm the one who's gonna have to do oh, it trust me I did try and convince others to do it <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember <laughs> absolutely I remember calling general assembly and saying so what do you think about doing you know, something for moms and they're like well why don't you just try coming to one of our classes and I thought okay I'll do it and I I did I went there you know it's a six o'clock on a you know like a Tuesday evening and I went with my sister I had to beg her to come with me because I knew they were on the top floor massive flight of yes. stairs had my big eye candy buggy with me and I'm thinking there is no way my poor baby's gonna end up on the floor I can't do yeah. that my own. and you've got like stuff that you will yeah. see for a fortnight and yeah it's all of those things and I think you've just got such a point about when you become a mum and you're very much in that world, I, not so much when I have my daughter, but when I have my son, everything just felt massive. It felt like um, it was a secret world. So these things of, you know, going and choosing your buggy, it was like, oh, well, don't mess this up because oh, otherwise yeah. you're going to scar your child for life. Or, you know, you'd go to these weaning workshops. I remember going to this thing at the doctor's and we're all like sitting in a circle and passing an apple to each other and going, hmm, yes, we must really cut this up or grate yeah. it so we don't like allow the child to check. And it's these things that would have been sim seemingly so simple before, but somehow. And so I love that you had that. No, no, no. Just because you're a mum now, it doesn't mean that your brain is suddenly going to leave the building and never yes. to return. Like this is the perfect time to to move things forward. And I guess what did the mums who came and experienced that? What did they learn, and how how did it change things in unexpected or expected ways? Yeah, I think you know what a good example is Sarah Titano, and I and I hope she won't mind me putting her on blast here. She knows she's like <laughs> she's the one person I I genuinely genuinely admire her story because she came on the pilot program and she had just been made redundant from BBC you know she had a great career there she just had a, a baby I think it happened while she was pregnant and she was trying to figure out what to do next and she'd come across this program that I was putting together and, and she came along and one of the things that we did was go on on field trips like we went to the BBC and one of the places we went to was Makers Academy which is a coding boot camp 
and you know it's a good chance for people to get a sense of what it was like to work at different companies and she found it so interesting and she was like okay after this I am going to do Makers Academy and she made it work she found a way to do it you know alongside breastfeeding her son her husband took um, a parental leave which was amazing I think he was one of the first men in his company to do that and she became a, de a developer she she can code and then she went on and built the company that she had dreamed about building for the longest time I remember when we first met at the beginning of the program she had this idea for creating a place for families to find activities for under fives mm. and she has made it come to life thanks to that journey and she's built happy today and believe it or not it's it has thrived through lockdown she's managed to make it you know fully remote experience she's currently onboarding so many providers that have been stuck and and she has done that with a fully remote team fully flexible oh. and i believe a fully um mom team and i love that and it's just shown that you know that community that power of having you know the right space to learn is yeah. key and you know that's that's something that I, I feel very proud of being a part of a small role in just sort of opening up that world to many moms you know we taught yes. 250 moms over three years and you know it may not seem like a really large number for me you know just having to balance that alongside two kids and and it's <laughs> no mean feat. and this is the thing it's like I always think about the ripple effect of what that actually means so that number and then showing their partner who then mentions it to somebody at work who then you know you're showing your child that this can happen and yeah. I heard um, an interview with Sophie Ellis Bexter and her mum yesterday on her podcast and it was so fascinating them talking about being creative in their um in the ways that they parent as well and how they both make it work as freelancers and still do what they love and I just thought gosh that's so important to show the way and actually I'm, I don't know if you found the same but when I've it's been showing my kids and my, I mean, my daughter, she's one this week. So she's not kind of, she's not all up in my business just yet. <laughs> I mean, she wants to, you know, be close and all the rest of it, but she's not, she's not aware of the numbers, but my four year old is really figuring out what work looks like and is asking questions. And the fact that I never like, mommy's leaving you to do this terrible thing that I absolutely hate and I'm so sorry and I, <laughs> I've got all of this stuff I'm going I'm gonna do this today and this is gonna be great and let's talk about it and I'll see you in a couple of hours and the fact that I can do a lot of my work via my laptop yeah. and so, sort of pop in and out and we can juggle it between us that's been really fascinating because hopefully by the time it comes to him getting a job he'll be like oh I've seen it like yeah. this is possible or I can be around or I can do um all kinds of things I can have an idea and make it happen um so yeah it's, it's been really fascinating it's interesting because my, my aunt and I actually had a discussion yesterday around what do the kids think I do and what do they <laughs> make of my my life? And and she was like, June, they probably think that every single mom is like you. And I'm yeah. like, okay, that is really interesting because you know, you know my um, portfolio career. I, yes. I, I work at Samos three days a week, but alongside that, I do a lot of other things. And I've always been conscious of showing the kids what I do with Moms in Tech. I took Ivy everywhere. She was like my little handbag. I called her my little co-founder. She was at every single meeting with me. And I did that intentionally because I wanted to make sure we partnered with the right kinds of companies. Yes. If I was going to turn up at that first meeting with my kids and you didn't welcome us, then I knew that you wouldn't welcome 15 other moms coming in. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so that that was always really critical. And then whenever Adam would have half term, he would come as you know as well and and really experience the classes. He would get involved in in some of the the sessions and and it's been really key in sort of shaping their their experiences. And I think you know, them seeing me sometimes on television is is nice and and just seeing that variety I want them to know that you can do anything 
you don't mm. have to do just one thing. There is no um, prescriptive formula for how you must work. And I, and I hope that that's what I'm showing them by sort of constantly talking about what I do. Or, you know, if I'm in an article, I show them and they ask me questions about it. Um, so we do have those very open discussions at home. And, you know, they say, you know, sh show them, sh you know, seeing is, is believing. I, I do hope they can, they can see that sort of anything is possible and not have any self-limiting beliefs because if that's sort of one thing I can achieve in the kids is to help them to to dream big yeah and and um saying it not just from a like this is what I'm doing and this is what's yeah. happening but showing them how you operate in yeah business and um my mum retrained as a teacher when I was nine years old and I watched her you know study and you know I was nine my, my brother was six and she was it was very much that time of like the early 90s where it was like oh cool you want to have a career as a woman sure but if you could just let us know still what time we're eating and um <laughs> the relatives are coming so if you could just prepare like three sets of three course meals as well and you know, it was all of those things that you know it wasn't necessarily an equal world at that you know as a woman you were still expected to be a bit of a Stepford uh wife and you know deliver the goods as it were yeah. and but I remember how my mum once she got her teaching job and eventually she became head how she ran her school based on kindness or the things that the the standards that she put in place like it was quite a um uh, a socially deprived um school and didn't have a lot of resources and you know there were many parents who were children themselves and you know had a lot of um situations that were very challenging and you know even my mum going okay a lot of these kids don't have breakfast before they come okay I need to make sure that I'm in the supermarket and I'm buying this food and because that's how we're going to get kids to leave so she didn't necessarily wait until she got the funding from yeah. the local authority because she yeah. was like this kind of needs to happen now and it's a bit unorthodox but I need to like make some moves and I think our children watching us in that way of like oh something's gone wrong right mummy's gonna fix it or she's gonna get on the phone or who do I call or what happens and you know not that I would put my son on the local bus but he would know how to get to our tube station because I'm yeah. like what can you see have we passed Tesco yet what's going on you know, <laughs> is the traffic it, because that's the world that we're bringing them into and you know I know that you're um, kids have sort of been on film sets and all sorts yeah. of things and I bet that's been so great for them in terms of because you know I can't imagine that you'd be the stage mum of like here's the talent everybody stand <laughs> back you know you will be like right you listen when they talk to you or, you know, or have you been polite have you said thank you to that person have you done what you needed to do because oh. if I find out you know you <laughs> haven't it's so interesting. I actually said to Ivy, um, what, what do you learn when you're, you're on set? And she goes, mommy, I learned very good listening skills. And I said, yes, yes, you do. And it's so true. They do have to take a step back and, and listen and digest a lot of information. But I love that they are learning to network. You know, yeah. I, I look back at the Copperfield sets and I am in awe that Ivy had that opportunity at the age of three to be no. such incredible um, masters of their craft. I mean, Tilda Swinton and Deb Patel, um, he, he, you know, it's just so many incredible people, but she composed herself so well. Yeah. And and I, I'm so proud of her. And um, I, I love that she can look back on that experience and and the many experiences she's had sort of in the, in the modeling and acting world and, and realized that she did that, you know, she did that as a, as, as a little girl. She um, had, had those beautiful experiences.
it's it's so great and the fact that when people when you're in the world of people who are at the top of their game or doing it you don't just learn the craft as I say you learn how people take phone calls and um I had somebody she's episode 19 if anybody wants to go back and listen but Indra Ove was an actor I worked with um I think it was a second job out of drama school and she had two young boys at the time and I didn't really know how I was going to make money as an actor let alone and throw children into the mix yeah. not that I would be throwing them because you know, <laughs> I wasn't at a stage of you know thinking about serious relationships or anything but I remember watching her switch over like her um, husband came to the set and we did this and they did a sort of switch over and she had supplies and she had sorted and there must have been something in my brain that clocked that and thought thank you got it it's possible yes, yes I've seen that and I've now been able to do that to other women. Like I, I, I haven't taken Luna anywhere yet, but with um, Oscar, my son, Matt and I were both up for the same thing and we were in the same room. And this woman was like, oh my goodness, how do you do that? I thought that it wasn't possible. And now that you're a parent and I said, no, hear it from me. Cause she was sort of 10 years behind. And it was such a lovely full circle moment that I could deliver that back to her. So um, yeah, I would love to talk about investing now and like how people start how people learn more because I know there were those random things about money of like a bank loan or a credit (laughs) card or like waiting until a rich man would come along and sweep you (laughs) off your feet or like you know growing up in the 90s you'd marry a footballer and then you'd have pretty (laughs) shoes and you never have to work again but I know a lot of people who are listening to this are in maybe their early stages of business or they're looking to go to the next level Um, how did you start to become familiar with the financial world and maybe taking example of sort of mums in tech and how did you get the the wheels in motion with that yeah I think that's definitely one of the most asked questions sort of where do you start how do you know what is the right type of funding for your business and I think my very first foray into the world of tech and investment was when I joined Silicon Valley Bank and and that was completely accidental after doing economics at UCL I was actually quite insistent that I would never get into finance (laughs) because I'd heard really horror stories about people Mm. working at investment banks and working ridiculous hours and I'd always been very conscious from an early age that work-life balance was pretty key to me and I wasn't key to do I didn't want to do sort of seven o'clock till three in the morning that just wasn't yeah. a big thing but a recruiter came up to me and and um and said they were looking for happy people and there was this new bank opening up in <laughs> London I'm like okay this is different I I want to know more and and that's how I joined SVB I I I was one of the first 20 employees in the UK but that was when I started really learning about finance. Um, I joined the venture debt team there and my first exposure was into sort of commercial due diligence, um, looking at sort of series A companies, the companies that were raising venture capital um, probably for the first time. We would come along and give them um, a bit of venture debt to layer on, which really just helps to extend the runway without having to dilute your cap table even further. And for, for those who are not familiar with the cap table, it's just essentially who, you know, who are the owners of, of the company. And every time you give shares away, you're giving away ownership. Um, so I think it's really important, first of all, to think ar- around who you want to be um, key people in your business. Who do you mm. want to spend quality time with? I know it's easy to just fall into the trap of thinking it's just money. But, you know, when they say think about smart money, it's, it's really important. You're going to be accountable to this person who's giving you um, money to help you start your business, grow your business, and they're going to want to have regular updates. They're going to be advising you, but maybe they might not be. There is also dumb money. There is money that completely adds no value and could potentially also be a problem. I've come across some founders who took money really early on in the journey from people who they probably didn't spend enough time getting to know and do their due diligence on. 
and very quickly found out that they probably were too um, nitpicky. It made yeah. the word you kind of want, Ooh, I'm just lost want to have here. investors that trust you, your business. Um, we're not meant to come in and run your business for you. Um, so it's very important that um, you, you take your time to choose the right partners because it is sort of a, a 10 year plus journey. And I would say it really depends on your type of business um, and scale. What, what is your dream for your business? Um, and not every business is going to want to be sort of taking over the world. And that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that there is a bit of pressure that people assume that if you start a business, you must be going for sort of world domination. <laughs> it, yeah. doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be the case. It is very fine. And it's very lovely to, to have your local, you know, family shop, mom and dad shop, um, and maybe you have a you know specific niche of customers you want to serve, and that is absolutely okay. Um, and I think that's where people assume that you know, every type of business should get venture capital. I I don't believe so. I think there are certain businesses that maybe are suited to friends and family, and that can yes. be all. You, that might be all you need to to get started. And perhaps you could very quickly be cash generative, and maybe you don't need any more money after that. You don't need to have the multiple, multiple rounds of funding. I think that's a very um, big misconception. I think companies that tend to need venture capital are the really, really capital intensive companies that you know, perhaps really need this money to, to get to scale, to yeah. build um, you know, the, the platforms behind the businesses. Um, perhaps you need to get some really expensive engineering talent, but ultimately you're going to be tackling a very, very large market. And that's why we really do spend a lot of time thinking about the market sizing um, and then really trying to understand the team. For yes. me, that team is super critical and, you know, VCs will, will tell you, we, we can invest at different stages. We have very often invested pre-product and that is totally fine, but it's super critical that that founder is the right person to be building that business and they've got the relevant experience. So in, in, in the one case um, where we invested pre-product, the founder had uh, sort of, they'd been three times a founder, you know, they, they had proven that they could set up a business and scale it, raise investment for it and exit it. So we had that strong belief that they could do it again. Yeah. Um, so that, that gave us confidence. So I think there's, it's sort of a recipe. You need to think about what elements of the recipe, perhaps that founder hasn't started business, but perhaps they have a co-founder who has, yes. or, or someone on their advisory board who, you know, will play a critical role. So they'll have a bit more hands-on experience from, from an external party to help get them up to speed. So, so you can get around it and I, and I, and people ask about whether or not they need to have a co-founder. I don't believe so. There are many successful solo founders. You look at Sharmadine Reed. Yeah. Um, founder of Beauty I Stella. love her. She's, She's incredible. Amazing. She's a force. And oh, I, whenever I'm just like need a bit of a, Ooh, okay. Yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> like I go on her Instagram, um, her IGTV or things like that, because just the way that she, um communicate I'd love to have her on here actually I think she'd be amazing but she just the way that she communicates knowledge and how she implements things that she breaks it down in such a tangible way Absolutely. um I guess if people are looking um to think about you know maybe they're starting to google the random thing like how do I get money um, yeah. for my business would an early stage be like writing down what your goals are in terms of where you sort of see this going so sort of connecting with the vision so you can then get the right things in place to move forward yeah I think at the early stage you really want to think about you know how much you need to to spend on your team. I think it's very easy in those early days to think, oh, I won't pay myself. I'll just sort of focus on the business. Yes. You, you need to pay yourself. You need to pay yourself because otherwise you're going to be distracted. You're going to be stressed about money. So really make a realistic budget. Include yourself, I would say, because I, I've, I've heard that story very often. I'm only going to raise 250. I won't pay myself the first year. That's not really realistic. And actually, that's not what we want to hear. We want to make sure you're looking after you. You're thinking about self-care, not burning out. 
um, and then you know factoring the team you need what what is that um, go to market strategy how much you need to spend on acquiring customers um, just really mapping out the real cost of getting it off the ground mm -hmm. and um, I think a lot of times people don't don't realize that there's actually so much power in community. I think that's obviously for certain, depending on what you're building. But if you come to an investor and say, I've got this strong community, we, we look at that. We actually think about, you know, what have you done to start to get to know your early customers? And I think yes. that goes a long way in helping us figure out if, if you really know your market inside out and, um, yeah, I think I think it's it's a it's a journey, but really take that time to to map out map out the true cost. Um, you know, maybe start with friends and family. I know that's a sort of an easy thing to say, and, and not everyone has necessarily access to to friends and family who have um, you know who are able to give you a couple hundred thousand here and there. I don't. Dad, I really need a million. <laughs> Can you just transfer? No, that would be great. Right. <laughs> But there, there are so many great networks out there, um, especially for female founders. There's, there's um, YSYS, which I highly recommend. Um, you know, speak to other founders about what's worked for them. There's a great database of angel networks that was recently published by um, Pietro at um, Stride. And I'm happy to share a link to, to the followers later. It's a great medium post. Um, it's Pietro Inverness. Um, so if you ch check him out, he, he's an investor at Stride and he, he recently put a document together, which I think is like gold dust because very mm. often a lot of the angels are very hidden. They're, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, there's Angel Academ, but apart from that, there are not many places where you can go and find this database of angel investors that you can go to. So it's, that's one thing I found even in, um, in venture and, it's sort of a closed network even getting in you sort of need to know someone who tells you about the roles and and it was quite a journey finding samos i think thanks to diversity vc i was made aware of the role but i think had it not you know had i not been you know sort of gotten into that world maybe i would never have found out about it because it's not roles are not always advertised on their websites yes and it's i'm a big believer that in that in terms of if i can shortcut the process for somebody else then i will happily do that introduction and i think sometimes knowing somebody in your network who's done what you want to do for the most part people are really willing to share and say yes of course let me introduce you or let me just take you for a coffee or things and um yeah for the most part I think especially women as well if we're um I, I remember there was actually two guests that um were trying to on my podcast earlier were one had raised investment and the other one was in the process of and I was like hang about these two people don't know each other yeah. I should introduce them and um show you know how possible things are is there anything in terms of you as your personality and you as the kind of the personal brand I guess in the investment which is really appealing that people are going to I guess bet on as well even if it's just an in there's something about them there's an instinct there's a I just really like this person is there anything that you could do in preparing or is it worth it being really likable in that situation oh absolutely I think of the, the companies in our portfolio and, and I like all the founders <laughs> it, yes it's so key and you know many people may not want to admit it but the reality is it's it's important that you have chemistry with with your investors because as I said earlier you're going to be spending a lot of time with them so really finding ways to connect um, I, I would encourage founders to do a bit of research on the investors before you go in because as much as they're doing DD on you, you need to do DD on them because yes. you're going to be spending time with me. So if, if you're coming in to chat with me, I, I have tons of information about myself online. I've done a ton of blog posts and, and podcasts and I've been in articles. So you, you can find information. You can read up about me and, and have a sense of the things that I care about, the things that I've invested in and, I think that just really helps to break the ice initially yes. have that rapport because 
end of the day, it's a very human business. I would say VC is 100% a people business. And I think that's why it, it really appealed to me because I'm massively a people person. So when I'm thinking about who I'd like to invest in and who I want to spend the next 10 years working with, I want to make sure they're good people. Like I yeah. won't be investing in in terrible people anytime soon. It's it's so key. It's like, you know me, Nikki. It's like, yes. I, I, I want to... We don't have to go, you know, to a comedy store, but I want to, I want to be able to have a nice, happy conversation with you and absolutely and authentic and feel yeah. that I can bring my whole self to that conversation as well. And I'd love if they felt that way too. And you know that about um, even going back to being on a film set, like if you're a nice person, you're going to gallop way up the list before you even get to a point of um, anything else. Before, If people know you, if there's a referral, and I'm now at the stage where a lot of my coaching clients come from other clients, like, oh, you should speak to Nikki, or da, 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 and it, it goes that way. Because if you continue just to show up in that way, people want to work with nice people, and I guess with you being an investor it's like sometimes the time that you spend with them isn't just in the boardroom doing things it could be on a flight or it could be yeah. waiting in a train station for something or like having to prep somebody under pressure or there's all kinds of unknown situations so yeah having that rapport is is really important so um, important because when things go wrong and, and they often do you want them to feel like they can call you and, and and have an honest conversation with you before it gets really bad and yes and i think that's sort of when it really counts whether or not you've you've had that um chance to build that good bond absolutely absolutely um how do you man you know covid19 aside <laughs> but like because uh, that's a whole different conversation but how do you manage your week so you can wear the different hats? I'm not going to say like, how do you balance being a yeah. mom? And, you know, because even balancing and working a personal brand in terms of growing that and delivering the work, but then documenting it and then growing and doing something that's going to pay off in two years, you know, that's no mean feat. Throw in three children into the mix <laughs> and a husband, you know, it's, it's, yeah, uh, to call it a juggle is is not even kind of justifying the point enough. <laughs> but what do you do to keep yourself really topped up, to keep yourself feeling sharp in a great place? So when that opportunity comes, you're there to serve and be able to fulfill it. I think the first thing I'd say is um, be willing to delegate. I, yes. I do. I've got a, a nanny that comes three days a week. So the days where I'm working at Samos, which is usually Tuesday to Thursday, she's here. So on those days, I'm able to sort of be heads down doing my work. And she is incredible. She takes care of everything to do with the kids. Um, so, yes. you know, I can sort of just, just really double down on work. And I have an incredible husband, I have to admit, you know, he is brilliant at you know, if I've, if I've got an event or, um, you know, I need to work a little bit later, he takes all over the, the dinner and, and, and he does all that stuff without ever complaining. We are very much an egalitarian household. And um, I think obviously that comes from having a mom that raised me. Um, yeah. I, I know that, um, you know, end of the day, women, women are strong. And I think she's, she's raised me to be a strong woman in that yes. sense. Um, and, and I do believe that everyone should play their part. And, you know, same with the kids, they, they chip in and, and do their bits around the house. So we, um, we sort of have a, a pattern. We take it in turns to do bedtime. And I would say my evenings are when I sort of manage to recharge. Kids go to bed at eight and I'm a Netflix junkie. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, oh my goodness. I, I love, I love my Netflix. Um, so I, I have a couple of shows that I will watch. I, at the moment I'm watching Umbrella Academy with Stephen and I'm also watching Good Girls. I binged on Working Moms, which I thought was excellent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, yeah, I like to have that time where I can just, you know, sit by myself and, and watch some shows or catch up with friends um, I think it's so important. I think COVID especially has really shown us sort of the importance of just unwinding 
I yes. don't take it for granted anymore. There are days I'll just, you know, run my bath, listen to a good podcast. I love a good podcast. Um, there's so many that I, obviously Michelle Obama's one is out now, so I'm, I'm very I excited I about that. Documentary <laughs> on. Um, on Netflix, have you seen it? It was I so, have. yeah, of course you've seen it, absolutely. She's amazing, she's amazing. And I, um, yeah, I think in this in this difficult time, I'm constantly seeking inspiration. So it, yeah, we just sort of have to have that toolkit for when it gets too much and knowing when it's time to just stop. So there are days yeah. where I will just switch off all my phones and you know, tell the kids to hide them. That is my new strategy. It works. They don't give it back until they're supposed to. <laughs> Good. And it's it's brilliant because I fully step away. Otherwise, I am checking social way too much. And then you check your emails. And I'm I'm very conscious on my days off to to fully just immerse myself in them and just yes. unwind. We have family time every Saturday where we watch movies together, eat popcorn and we love it. We look forward to it. Um, I'm really strict with that as well because it has to, because otherwise I just think, what am I, what am I doing all this for? Or like, you know, it has to be. And I think I've had this weird relationship with social media recently of, you know, how much do I show my children and like, why am I here? And what am I, why am I here? The big old questions. um, What am I here to do? What's most useful? What's a good use of my time? And for me, I've always continued to keep showing my children, you know, a limited view of them because I just think I can't just talk about becoming a working mom yeah. and then not actually seeing my children because that's just uh, disingenuous and not helpful in that way. And I think it can be so easy unless you have those strong boundaries in place to always answer the thing or just do a quick call or just catch up on something. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've really had to double down on going, is this important? actually this person could wait for this and I don't have to do it immediately and oh but nobody teaches you this stuff you have to learn the hard ugly way sometimes so exactly you? exactly but yeah p- p- personal time is is super critical to me because as much as I'm I, I, I love to sort of give my time and um, I'm conscious that when I was running Mums in Tech that probably was my downfall in a way. And I think that's part of why I ended up having a bit of burnout towards the end. I was just saying yes to way too yeah. much. And I think it's so important that, you know, we as women learn very early on that it's okay to say no. You can't be, you know, making every single person happy. You have to think yeah. about yourself and it's okay to put yourself first. And I think we we often feel this guilt that, um, we shouldn't be selfish. It is it is okay because if you don't look after you, how can you look after anyone else? Absolutely. And we're teaching, you know, those little people around us, yeah. uh, all these bigger people, you know, how how to take care. It's a skill that I'm passing on to them. So, you know, my son watches me make this quite extensive porridge situation every <laughs> single morning and I take my time and I'm putting the berries on and oh. I'm seeing that you know it's a real sort of ritualistic thing I really enjoy starting my day in that but I'm showing him that and also he gets one as well so he's happy but <laughs> it's um, I'm showing him like it's really important to put some good stuff in your body in the morning yeah. and um you know he's already started asking me questions like is this going to give me energy and I you know, love I know that. to talk about like healthy or sugar or yeah. you know go too much in that just yet but I, I do talk about it's going to give you energy. It's going to make your brain sharp. It's going to set you up for the day and keep you warm in the winter and all those kind of old oh, wives' tales. So, yeah, it's interesting. But what is next for you? What have you got cooking at the moment? <laughs> um, um, yeah, I always, you. always starting something. And I think really random idea. I just, you know, thinking about how I can, I can help more and, but I do an event for, for female founders with my mm. friends, Yvonne and Charmaine. And we did one in June. And I think, no, the first one was in, was in May. 
and it was supposed to be a one-off, but we had so much interest from female founders, especially black female founders. And very quickly it's turned into a thing. And we, we did, we've had two more events since one with, um, one of the partners at Index Ventures, Danny Reimer. And last month, we, ju we just did one with um, Black VC, with the incredible Monique Woodard and Mercedes Bent. And it seems like it's now an official community, which yes. I, I absolutely love because obviously female founders are the reason why I got into VC. It was through that journey of um, running mums in tech and coming across so many female founders who weren't getting invested. But that was my main motivation for joining. Mm. I wanted to help change the stats, to have someone that, that looked like them sitting at the table, being able to make investment decisions. Um, that that was my motivation. And I'm thinking Amazing. thinking about doing a show. So, you know, watch this space. It's, it's early days, but um, I, I, I've always said, you know, Oprah is my idol i absolutely yes everything about oprah so i can't believe we've only just mentioned her we've been talking to oh, you for I, five minutes i I, so I, oprah, I I love super soul sunday i don't know if you yes you oh, I'm all, oh yes i really, all of it it's it's um you know whenever i need some inspiration um Super Soul is brilliant. Um, yeah. Obviously, and Zoe Motherkind is another one that I, I really like. Um, oh, she's great as well. Yeah, she's been on this podcast and I've been on her. She's brilliant. And you'd be brilliant on um, on hers as well. I will hook you up. But yeah, it's one of those moments actually with Oprah that I love her 360 version of the world, that it's not just about the business or yeah. spiritual spirituality or, um, you know, feeling good or connection or relationship it's about that whole package and I yeah. think certainly after COVID it is about that wholehearted way of doing life and business and we can't just compartmentalize things anymore I heard Mary Porter's talking about all of these big um companies and she's like why why are there these huge grand reception areas when they could easily be made into creches yeah. or people being able to exactly. have their baby on the side so they're at the table still and I just oh. thought oh my goodness like how many big bulbous bars are they're full of lilies and all kinds of weird statues and actually they could build something so people could take their babies rather than commuting and oh yeah there's so much work to be done but, so um, much. I, but I do love that COVID has normalized a lot of that definitely we're winning on the work from home space um, uh, we are. a lot a lot of people who worked in roles where their employers used to say you can't work from home have we yeah. proven that we can indeed work Turns from home? Out. <laughs> yeah I mean I think that has sort of fast forwarded that discussion a couple of years which I'm really excited about and it's forced many teams to get an insight into other people's realities. I have been Zoom bombed yes. by my kids <laughs> in multiple meetings, but I think that that's been great in even further, you know, showing that authenticity. I had a meeting where I, Ivy, the five-year-old, <laughs> decided she was like, oh, mom, I want this on the iPad. And then she jumps on the chair and she's like tugging my hair and she's whipping it from oh, side to wow. side. But, but the people loved it. They loved it. Yes. I was like, <laughs> they just had a chance to see look, this is, this is what June's going through. Um, she's yeah, and cool. look at what she's doing. And she's doing, you know, she's going, she's doing all these things. And also she's acing it in other areas. And oh. I, th I definitely think like, I've never missed the tube. I've never thought, gosh, I'd really love to be on that sweaty Victoria line now. Exactly. Like that would make me so happy. <laughs> I've not, I mean, I'm a huge, you know, advocate of the London Underground. I think they're great, but I haven't missed it. But yeah. um no, anyway, I good. know you're a busy woman, so tell us like where can we find you and how can people find out more and um, some next steps, I guess, of what people can can do moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So people can find me on Twitter and Instagram at June Angelides. Feel free to follow me. Feel free to do link tree where female founders can book a mentoring session with me. So I, since the beginning of lockdown, I now have two days a week where I dedicate... Um, I dedicate 60 minutes 
actually it's more no i give 120 minutes because i've got yes um two two days um i get an hour slot where people can book 20 20 minute sessions with me and we can talk about anything from you know wanting to start your business funding options and you know if, if you just just want to have a chat about what you're building and, and get some insights from me i am more than happy to help so feel free to to use that and you know people can there's a lot of information about me online feel free to read and if you have any questions just just um, reach out amazing thank you so much i feel like i want to win. i want to i'm gonna go and ask my dad and see if he's got a spare hundred grand yeah. <laughs> Because you told me, June said, ask your friends and family. You never know. know. <laughs> and they'll be like, oh my goodness, what are you going to do? What's happening? <laughs> um, yes, that's amazing. I've loved chatting. Thank you so much for being such a brilliant guest. And it's so useful. And, you know, you're such an inspiration to me as well. I just love seeing what you're doing and following your adventures. And oh, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, Nikki. Great talking to you. And you too. Bye. 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 thank you so much for listening to today's episode i really hope you got something from it and if you did and would like to share feel free to tag me across social media at nikki raby or you can email hello at nikki raby.com you can also go to my website nikki raby.com to find out more about how i can support you sessions courses prices availability etc oh and there's loads of freebies to get you started Another episode will be with you shortly, but in the meantime, do rate, review and subscribe and I will see you soon. Bye.